So Rigatti Computing started three years ago. Uh, it was founded by Chad Rigatti, and uh, now we are like uh, approximately 85, 90 people. We are like a startup company, and we are based in Berkeley. So if you want to come and visit us, uh, just do it. So <laughs> I will start from the basic of uh, superconducting qubits and quantum computation. Uh, so I will, I, I've tried the best to simplify this presentation as much as possible so that everybody can uh, follow me. So if you have some questions, uh, please uh, uh, ask. Okay, so let's start. So uh, as you know, you have like laptops. In, in your laptops, you have transistors. So you can imagine a transistor like a, a box, a box that, that can be either empty or full. If the box is empty, that's zero. If a box is full, that's one. The idea of quantum computing is to replace these boxes with qubits. So this is a qubit. A qubit is like a box that can be either empty or full. But there is something new about qubits. Qubits can also be empty and full at the same time. And this state is called superposition state. Usually, in, uh, in the superconducting qubit community, we call this state ground state, we call this state excited state, and we call this state superposition state. So something that I want to be clear about is that quantum computing is not about taking the transistors and trying to make them smaller. The idea is instead is to replace the transistors with new components called qubits. And the main difference is that these qubits can be in a superposition state. Physicists like to have to use a fancy notations. So instead of writing just uh, 0 and 1, and they, they prefer to put these brackets around 0 and 1. So this is called Dirac notation, and it was introduced in 1930. Superposition state is something that has been discovered many years ago by Eisenberg and Schrodinger, who uh, introduced quantum mechanics in 1925. So let, great, so how do you build a qubit? You build a qubit in many different ways. I'm gonna explain how at Rigetti we build our qubits. So our qubits are basically two pieces of metal, aluminum, touching each other. So imagine if you have like a piece of, of aluminum, another piece of aluminum, and these two pieces are touching each other there. So the dimension of this uh, pad is approximately 100 micron by 100 micron, and the thickness is approximately 100 nanometers. And then the uh, overlapping area is just 200 nanometers. So these uh, uh, pieces of aluminum are uh, placed on top of silicon, and this is the way you build a qubit. I'm gonna show you some pictures of uh, qubits later. Okay, great. So imagine that you have 1,000 electrons on this pad, and 500 electrons on that pod. You could move one electron from one side to the other side of the junction. So this little thing is called junction. So if that happens, you're gonna have 999 ele electrons here and 501 ele electrons there. So this state is called the ground state and we call this state excited state. So that's zero and that's one. In quantum mechanics, it's permitted that a particle is in two positions at the same time, and this is called the quantum superposition state. So it's like saying that the electron is on the, less, on the left of the junction and on the right of the junction at the same time. It's not completely right what I'm saying, and it's not completely accurate, but just uh, for simplicity, for the time being, I'm just saying that the, it's like saying that the electron is on the two sides at the same time. Okay, this is the superposition state. Now I'm gonna show you an image of an actual superconducting qubit. So this uh, superconducting qubit has been fabricated at Rigetti. So here, what do, what do you see? You see a piece of aluminum and another piece of aluminum connected by a junction. So obviously the two pods can have any shape you want. So in this case, we decided to uh, go for this uh, geometry. So one electron can jump from this side to the other side and the qubit, so this is a superconducting qubit, is gonna go from the ground state to the excited state. Okay, so the dark region is silicon, this stuff is aluminum. Great, so if you want, you can also have a look at the junction. The junction is really small, is uh, right there. And this is a, a SEM image of the chip. So this is an optical image that is uh, done with a single electron microscope. And you can see the junction, it's pretty small, it's uh, just 200 nanometers by 200 nanometers. 
And one electron can jump from one side to the other side. I was not super accurate. Actually, it's not one electron. It's a pair of electrons called the Cooper pair. But it doesn't matter for, for the time being. Just assume there is one electron jumping from, from one side to the other side of a junction. OK, great. Uh, if you want to measure the qubit, you must uh, use uh, a component. So for superconducting qubits, uh, we use uh, resonators. So a resonator is uh, this guy. It's a uh, inductance, and it's a capacitance put together. So a resonator is the way you can measure a qubit. When you measure a resonator, this is what you get. you get. You get a resonance. So if you combine the resonator and the qubit together on a chip, you, have, uh, you, get, um, you get these. So you have the resonator and the qubit. So here you see the qubit, that piece of aluminum, that piece of aluminum connected by, connected by the junction. And then you have the resonator and the qubit capacitively coupled with this coupler. OK, so when you measure the resonator, this is what you get. You get a resonance. How can you tell if the QB is in excited state? How can you tell if the electron jumps from one side to the other side of a junction? The way we do it is by measuring the resonator. So if the resonator, if the QB is in the ground state, so the electron didn't jump on the other side, uh, then you get the blue uh, curve. Instead, if the electron jumps on the other side, the resonance shifts to the left by approximately one megahertz. So in this way, we can tell if the qubit is either in the ground state or in the excited state. This, this uh, field is called uh, circuit quantum electrodynamics, uh, and it was uh, introduced, uh, it was discovered uh, in 2004 by the Yale group, and now is used by everybody in the superconducting qubit community. So once uh, you have one qubit one, and one resonator, you can put eight qubits and eight resonators all together. And this is how a chip looks like. So you have uh, one qubit there, one there, three, four, five, six, seven, eight qubits. And then you also have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight resonators. So this chip is uh, five millimeters by five millimeters. And OK, you, here you can see the qubits, the resonators. And these guys here are called waveguides. These waveguides are connected to cables, uh, like this cable, so that you can uh, uh, deliver electrical pulses to the qubit. So you have a cable connected to this waveguide, and you can send pulses uh, to the qubit and to the resonator, so that you can probe the resonator and you can excite the qubit, so you can make the electron jumping from one side to the other side of the junction. So I have uh, here a uh, uh, sample so that I would like to show you. So this is a chip that was uh, fabricated at Rigetti. So this is an actual uh, quantum computer, I would say. So it's on silicon, uh, so it's the same uh, chip. Uh, so this is a simple piece of silicon with some aluminum on top. And the aluminum is just 100 nanometers thick. OK, uh, probably I should move to the next slide. So you can see the uh, device. So this is a die, is 25 by 25 millimeters. And here you can see 12 copies of the same chip. So what we do at Rigetti is uh, to cut the chip with a saw or with a blade. And then we take just one little square, and we measure it, and we use it as a quantum computer. So something that I didn't mention is that Rigetti has two sites. One is in Berkeley, and one is in Fremont. So the site in Fremont fabricates the chips. Instead, the silo in Berkeley measures the chips. So something that probably I should mention is that these devices don't work at room temperature. So they only work at minus 273 degrees Celsius, at 10 millikelvin. Otherwise, quantum mechanics doesn't show up. So what we do is to take the chip, we put it inside a sample holder, and then we connect the cables to these uh, little connectors. We take the sample holder and we put it inside a fridge, a very special fridge. So here you can see four fridges, one, uh, two, three, and four. The chip is inside this fridge, and uh, the, these cables are connected to the, to the chip. 
So through these cables, you deliver the electrical pulses to excite the qubit from the ground state to the excited state. I usually work uh, there, so that's my desk. <laughs> Okay, so these fridges, uh, they go down to 10 minikelvin. They take 24 hours to reach 10 minikelvin, and then they take 24 hours to go back to room temperature. So my job, my work, is to send the electrical pulses to the qubit so that the electron jump, jumps from one side to the other side of the junction in a coherent way. So the electrical pulses that I send to the qubit are like these ones. Uh, so these are one volt electrical pulses. If you send uh, an electric pulse uh, with an amplitude of one volt, the, the qubit goes from zero to one. Instead, if the applied pulse is just 0 0.5 volts, uh, the qubit goes from the ground state to the, um, to the superposition state. So this is the way we have to uh, create superposition states in our superconducting qubits. Okay, so where are we now? So this is the state of the art. So a calculator can be used to simulate an 8 qubit device. So a quantum computer with 8 qubits is not powerful at all. Uh, a laptop can simulate a quantum, a quantum computer with 20 qubits. And here is uh, where we are now. Uh, the most powerful supercomputer in the world can be used to simulate a 60 qubit device. And that probably is going to happen next year. But uh, in 2019, I hope we're going to get 120 qubits, and probably in 2023, 1,000 qubits. So with uh, the current technology, uh, you cannot do that much. Uh, uh, our quantum computers are not as powerful as the most, super, super compu the, more, the most powerful computer in the world, but we're getting there. So there are three big players uh, right now, and I would say that the big players are IBM, Rigetti, and Google. Uh, I'm just talking about the companies that have published uh, scientific work uh, in this uh, field, uh, showing that they have uh, more than uh, uh, five qubits, I would say. Why do we care about building quantum computers? Because there are difficult problems to solve. So there are easy problems, difficult problems, and super difficult problems. Okay, what are the easy problems? The easy problems are like uh, division, multiplication, summing two numbers together. Factoring is a pretty difficult problem. And then a really difficult problem is, uh, the, for example, three coloring or three sat. So there are other uh, problems that are really difficult to solve. So one of these problems, for example, is, the, is uh, when uh, you want to go from one city to another city uh, along the minimum path, and you want to visit each city at least once. Finding the solution of that problem is pretty difficult. Quantum computers are not going to solve all of the problems. So they're going to solve the easy problem, they're going to solve the difficult problems, but they're not going to solve the really difficult problems, the super difficult problems. We don't know yet some algorithms that are going to solve those difficult problems. So how do we do it? Basically, in a classical computer, you have the NOT gate, the XOR gate, the AND gate, so what do you do is uh, you have a bit, and then you move the bit from 0 to 1. Instead of a quantum computer, you have the same kind of gates. Uh, so you can uh, apply an AND gate, a XOR, a NOT gate. But apart from these gates, you also have the Adamard and fa the phase gate, for example. So the Adamard is the gate that, goes, that brings the qubit from 0 to the superposition state. So roughly speaking, we could say that a quantum computer behaves like a classical computer. But on top of that, we also have other gates, like the Hadamard gate and the phase gate that we can ex explore and exploit. <coughs> I'll give you an example. Um, so this is the Grover's algorithm. It was discovered in 1996. And basically, what it does is to find the name John Smith in an unsorted database faster than a classical computer. So you have a database. You want to find the name John Smith. This is the uh, speed of the algorithm for a quantum computer and for a classical computer. So for a classical computer, it's linear. For a quantum computer, the uh, speed up is uh, quadratic. There are also other algorithms. And one of these, uh, one of the most famous one, is uh, the Shor's algorithm. So suppose that you have the number 15, and you want to factorize the number 15. 
Okay, it's pretty easy. The factors of 15 are 3 and 5. For 21, the factors are 3 and 7. Uh, laptop can solve this problem in one millisecond, and also a uh, one million qubit quantum computer can solve this problem in one millisecond. Okay, that's good. <laughs> So what about a 400-digit four, a number? So suppose that you have like a, a massive number with 400 digits, and you want to find the factors of this number. A normal computer, like a laptop, it takes 1,000 years. A, a quantum computer with 1 million qubits is going to take one hour, so much less. So this algorithm is called Shor's algorithm. It was discovered, it was discovered in 1994. And uh, it's uh, a really powerful um, algorithm, and it's also pretty scary. So why is it scary? Because when you send an email to a person, the password of that email is, uh, can you factorize this number? And the number is a uh, 400 digit, digit long. So if uh, uh, someone can factorize that number, he could potentially open your email. But the thing is that nobody has a quantum computer. Nobody is gonna open that email uh, before one million years. That's why that protocol is called PGP, which stands for pretty good privacy. It doesn't matter if someone is going to open your email in one million years, right? So that's, quite, that's why it's quite safe. A quantum computer could uh, break RSA in uh, one hour, but that is not going to happen now. It's going to happen probably in 10 years. But anyway, there are also other ways to, uh, to encrypt our emails uh, based on quantum key distribution. And probably I'm going to talk some about this at the end of my presentation if you are interested in, in, the, in this issue. Another, um, another big problem is uh, understanding how molecules behave. So if you want to break RSA and uh, do factoring of uh, big numbers, you need a one million qubit quantum computer. But this is not going to happen in the next two years. This is not going to happen in the next three years. So what can we do with the, computers, with the quantum computers that we have now? We can understand molecules. So you have a water molecule, you have the oxygen molecule. So here you have uh, two electrons. Uh, here you have got 16 electrons, 10 electrons, uh, 14. You can use uh, two qubits to simulate the hydrogen molecule. You can use uh, 20 qubits to simulate the oxygen molecule. The thing is that a laptop cannot simulate a molecule efficiently. It takes a, a laptop must use many approximations and will never give you the exact solution. Instead of a quantum computer, it can give you the exact solution. And this field is called quantum chemistry, and that is like the main application of quantum computers in the next two or three years. I would like to show you this uh, uh, slide now. So suppose that you have the hydrogen molecule, so two, two hydrogen atoms, uh, one next to another, and the distance between the two nuclei is about uh, 0.1 nanometers. So you can use a quantum computer to simulate this system, using your qubits to simulate this uh, uh, system. Uh, for the scientists here, uh, you can do this because the Hamiltonian of this uh, problem can be mapped into the Hamiltonian of a quantum computer with an isomorphism. Um, this is a really nice graph in which you can see the potential energy of the hydrogen molecule. And these are the solid line is the expected behavior of the hydrogen molecule. So the hydrogen molecule is so simple that you can solve it with a pen and a piece of paper. And the, what you get with a quantum computer is pretty similar to the expected behavior. And you see that the distance between the two molecules is approximately 0.1 nanometers which is exactly what we expected. So what is going to happen in the next year is, is, is that b bigger computers are going to be developed, and we are going to um, simulate bigger molecules, uh, like benzene or... Uh, so which are the molecules and which are the systems that we would like to simulate? Um, for example, consider this process. Uh, this process uh, uh, is used to create ammonia. This process, process is called Haber process, and it happens at 800 degrees uh, thanks to a special catalyst. So the same process uh, can, is done by bacteria at room temperature. So imagine if uh, we could uh, simulate with a quantum computer the catalyst for this uh, process. That would save us the 5% of the natural gases every year. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>